chapter 13. We'll pick up in verse 1. Actually, you know, it's kind of um, a series of messages on the early church. And so um, when we talk about the early church, we mean basically the church that is in the book of Acts during that time period. That's what it means, the early church. Actually, in church history or Christian history, early church period would cover up to about 300 or so A.D. But in biblical teaching, we will cover the book of Acts. That's how I look at it. Okay? And that this is the early church period. There's a lot of things in the book of Acts we haven't covered in this series. All in between in the stories. In order to bring certain points out, I focused on only certain areas. We jumped all the way to chapter 13 today from chapter 11. Where were they first called Christians? In Antioch, right. That's Syrian Antioch. Now this mission team goes all the way to uh, Pisidian Antioch up in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. That's like the, the end of their mission trip and then they head back down in toward uh, Syrian Antioch. So it's quite a trip they go on. They actually leave the shore from Syrian Antioch and go out to the island of Cyprus. They, they go across, they preach in the city there, and then they go across the island to Paphos, and they preach in that city. And this is very familiar territory because guess what? Barnabas is from Cyprus. He's an islander. Okay? And so he's uh, very familiar, and probably John Mark, who is their assistant. And he's a cousin of Barnabas. He would also be familiar with Cyprus. And so they, they go to Cyprus, they leave out from Paphos, and they head due north from the island of Cyprus across the Mediterranean Sea to a place called Perga, I think is the location, and then into what we call Asia Minor in Bible. We call it Asia Minor. Today it's Turkey. And so their first mission journey what we find in Acts 16 is, remember, the church center has transferred now. It's moved from Jerusalem north to Antioch. And Antioch is truly an international church. Truly an international church. You'll see it here in this passage of Scripture especially. Okay, and we'll talk more about it. The church in Antioch had had, uh, had become a great, it would be destined to be a great missionary church. God brought together a tremendous team to work together <laughs> there. And uh, we're going to look at the names of these, uh, these team members here in this passage. Not only was it the church itself very dynamic and international, but they also had this vision of conquering the Roman world with the gospel. Okay? And so they were going to go from Antioch all across the Roman world through a series of missionary journeys. And uh, of course they're going to need the, the right workers to do it. And so they choose their finest and their best to do this, to send out, to do this work. But it does not leave the home church weaker. It actually strengthens the home church as they go out because they get a better vision of what God is doing uh, in, in the uh, world of their day. And there's, uh, we'll look at the workers that are established in Antioch by this time. And so Antioch Church is a great missionary church. It becomes a sending church and a training church so that the uh, workers are well trained. There's a host of teachers, a host of prophets there for, for this developing church and uh, in such a way that the people are well trained 
in order to expand the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. The Roman roads were set up. The language was set up. The international language was there. The, the travel and all of that was in place at that time so that it would facilitate more easily the spread of the gospel. God worked not only in a little church here and a little church there, but He worked through the government structure. He was working through the uh, uh, economic system, I guess, in a sense, and the uh, uh, infrastructure of the empire. Some of the roads can still be seen today. The rocks and how they were laid out, they were so good that they can still be seen today. And uh, God had prepared a unique environment for the spread of the gospel during this time in, in history. But God uses people. And that's what we're going to see in this passage especially. The people God uses. Let's look in uh, Acts uh, 13. After the death of Herod, at the end of chapter 12, Barnabas and Saul finished this mission and they returned from Jerusalem. This is verse 25 of chapter 12. It's the very last. They took with them John, also called Mark. John Mark. He would be the author of the book of Mark. Okay. Chapter 13, verse 1. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. <clears throat> the two of them, on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. They arrived at Salamis. They proclaimed the Word of God in the Jewish synagogues. And John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to <clears throat> Paphos. Okay, that's verse 6. And then there's a story of a sorcerer here. This is our second sorcerer found in the, the uh, early story. First it was Simon, and now it's Elamus. We won't spend time with him. You can go and look, read the story, okay? Uh, go down to verse 13 of Acts 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, that be you north from Cyprus across the Mediterranean Sea where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Okay? So John Mark, who was with them assisting the team, left. And we do not know why he left. The Bible does not say why he left. We just know Paul's reaction later to why he left was negative. Barnabas' reaction was positive. That's all we know. And it, it caused two mission teams on the second trip out. Okay? So just this event where John leaves the group. Okay, so let, let's... Uh, let's um, yeah, let's pray. Father, You are our God. And we worship You. Lord, we want our lives surrendered to Your will always. We want the Lord Jesus Christ to be glorified in our thoughts and in our life. Where, we, where we're going and where we are, may the Lord Jesus be glorified. We want Your Spirit to guide our steps as individuals 
and as a church. We want you, oh God, to empower us to have an influence, a dynamic, make a dynamic difference in the world that we're living in. We want you, Lord, to establish your kingdom in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our nation, in our world. We want you to advance that kingdom and that it might ever increase greater and with greater influence in this godless, wicked world. We want the message of the gospel to reach every soul possible. We want, Lord, that those that are sitting in darkness might see a great light. We want, Lord, that the Gentile people of the world, that all the nations might know the Lord Jesus Christ. We want, Lord, that Your grace and mercy might flow like a river in our hearts and out of our lives. <coughs> we want, Lord, that our church will not be average. We want our church to be alive, full of Your Spirit. We want, Lord, that there will be ministry taking place in the hearts and minds of people. We want, Lord, that You will call out those who will go with the Gospel, whatever the cost. We want, Lord, that You will work mightily in us and through us. Lord, that the glorious Gospel will be proclaimed we want, Lord, that You will help us in our weakness. <clears throat> Strengthen us, Lord, that we might serve You properly. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Success and failure. When you think about missionary work, when we think about it, <clears throat> sometimes it goes well. Sometimes not so well. <laughs> think about it. When you think about your Christian life, some days are glorious. Some days are fun. Some days are filled with victory. <clears throat> Other days, defeat, disappointment, and hardship. Is God still real? So what do you think of when you think about a missionary? What do you think of when you think of someone who is serving God? What is success? What is failure? We know we have to be careful. We know as a church there's a critical element where we have to be careful who is who is doing what for the Lord? But we also know that with the Lord, sometimes things are very unpredictable. We have to be careful working with new believers and old believers, young believers, skinny believers, fat believers. We have to be careful, right? We might offend someone. We might hurt their feelings. They might get disappointed. We have to be careful. Why is it this way? Because we're people. That's all. We're people. We're nothing more. We're not statues. We're not idols. We're people. People with feelings and personality. People that sometimes are glad and sometimes are sad and sometimes are mad. We're people. People God uses. People God works in. People God has changed their lives. We're just people. Success and failure. We mark it by how we look at people. When you think about your Christian life, whether you're successful or not, you feel it inside. 
But others look at us and they measure us according to some standard. We don't know what it is. It varies depending on who's looking, right? And it all depends on, on uh, what their view or opinion might be of us at the time. So success and failure is very un uncertain when it comes to working with people and when it comes to serving God. There was this helper. His name was John Mark. Two names so that we can designate him from keep him apart from the apostles. Okay? He's not the Apostle John. He's not John the Baptist. He's John Mark. He's a close friend and associate of Peter. And on this first mission trip, he went as an assistant. He's not even named as those who were sent out. He was just their assistant. That's what it says. He was there to help them. He's a cousin of Barnabas. He... He had trouble on the trip. We don't know exactly, but maybe we could guess. On his journey as they traveled to Cyprus, this was familiar land. It was the beautiful island work of the missionary. It's easy to work on the island. You can kick back and enjoy the sand and the sun. You can go to the church and the windows are open and the breeze blows through. It's easy to work on the island. And they can go and people listen and people are laid back. They're not on the edge like in the city. It's easy to work on the island. But when they left the island, John had some trouble. He said in north, the, the boat ride was rough. They made it to Turkey. This is strange land. Never been here before. Maybe he was young and inexperienced. He didn't know exactly how to predict things. And so he had some fear in his heart. I'm going home, he said. Barnabas, he's his cousin and Paul, very strong-willed Paul, they let him go. He turned around and went back home. And we don't see him again until the story later. The second trip, Paul and Barnabas get in a big argument about a third person. John Mark. Paul and Barnabas are headed out. And Barnabas says, let's take John again. Paul says, no way. He failed. No way can he go again. Barnabas, Barnabas says, well, we should take him. So they square off face to face. Probably argued about it like people do. And they said, he must go. Paul said, fine. I'm going with Silas. You do what you want to do. So Barnabas and John Mark went one direction. Paul and Silas go the other. And the rest of the book of Acts deal with Paul and his ministry. Success and failure. Paul comes to the point in his life when he's about to die. He's looking back over his life and he's thinking, you know, what all God had done, the glorious things, the wonderful things he had experienced in ministry. And he thought, bring John Mark. He's useful. After those years, things changed. Cousin Barnabas was able to train him and disciple him. Success and failure. When working with people, it's important. People are people. Sometimes the greatest make the greatest failures, the biggest mistakes. And that's exactly what may have happened in the case of John Mark. So what do you think when you consider a missionary? A missionary church, Acts 13, God uses a variety of people in the work of missions. And churches have to take a risk when they're with, with, with their Christian workers. The Lord had brought together the home team in Antioch. It was quite a, a variety of people. Barnabas, the great leader, the Jewish man from Cyprus, the islander is there. He's the mature believer. Simeon called Niger, a black Jewish man. God doesn't see differences. He creates mission teams. 
He looks at our hearts. We shouldn't see differences either. Lucius of Cyrene, from the capital of Libya, in North, the North African city, he's the urbanite. The man from the city that would understand the other cities of the great empire. Lucius of Cyrene. Manian, from the political background. He, chose, he was a close friend of politicians. He would be able to organize and plan. He would understand power and influence. Manian and Saul, the former persecutor of the church, the terrorist against Christians, the highly educated Jew from the northern area of Tarsus, and get this, the former international student. You got it? He had gone down to Jerusalem to get trained. And it, he had been greatly feared by the believers for good reason. And then, the one not listed here, he's just the assistant, John Mark. Barnabas' cousin, the helper in ministry from Jerusalem. You know, when God brings together a team, He's not asking your permission or mine. Right?